What is Animal Crossing? This is a question that I will attempt to answer during this mini-series on the franchise, but more specifically on the latest entry to the franchise, Animal Crossing New Horizons. I understand, and you probably do too, that the question, what is Animal Crossing, is a tricky one, and shouldn't be taken lightly. In an interview with Nintendo Europe, one of the original creators of Animal Crossing, Katsuya Iguchi reminisced about the original launch of Animal Crossing on the N64, stating it was unprecedented gameplay. So we were worried whether it would be understood and accepted by the player base. First of all, it was very difficult to explain the gameplay. What kind of game is it? We were asked. Now, that might be a good place to start. What kind of game is it? Now, we could be as broad as possible and say Animal Crossing is a digital video game made for the Nintendo Switch and can be played in handheld or docked mode. But that doesn't really cover the essence of the real question. You could even delve a little deeper and say it's a game with a third person perspective, which isn't a bad place to start as the first person shooter genre is 50% defined by the perspective of first person, but the other 50% being the shooting is just as important. Even though Animal Crossing is played from a third person perspective, it isn't the same as, say, Splatoon or Gears of War. When people ask what kind of game your game is, they aren't asking what console is it on, or whether it's even digital like a video game, or physical like a board game. They are asking what experience they will have whilst playing your game. For that, I think it's best to endeavour to categorise Animal Crossing into a genre of a game. Game Maker's Toolkit, if you don't watch him then I recommend you do, he is one of the best video essayists on game design out there. In his video essay on the Souls-like genre, or more so whether we need such a genre, gave a short step-by-step -step guide on how genres are usually created. This is relevant because we can take such a guide and compare it to the causal mechanistic schemas, or gameplay mechanics, of Animal Crossing, and see whether we can determine which genre it sits comfortably in. In the aforementioned video essay on the Souls-like genre, the simplified explanation of the process of the creation of the genre goes as such. A unique and innovative game is created, in the video it's Doom, games clone it, games clone those clones but add tweaks and changes, the process continues like this as more tweaks and changes are made to the formula until eventually you are just left with a couple of the core mechanics that are shared among all of them. And there you have it, a genre. We can retrofit this process to Animal Crossing. Let's say we take the causal mechanistic schemas of hitting a tree with an axe to obtain wood. This mechanic is broadly found in a lot of survival games since the release of Minecraft. Examples such as Don't Starve, Rust, the Forest, Ark Survival Evolved, Starbound, Terraria, and Factorio spring to mind when I think of survival games, and they all involve hitting trees to get wood. However, on the other hand, you can say that same thing about games like Subnautica, Project Zomboid, and even No Man's Sky that don't involve hitting trees to get wood. However, those examples of games are as such due to the context and setting. So if we take a step back a little, we can say that almost all survival games, including the horror genre, require you to cultivate resources, either by hitting trees or rocks, or even just scavenging without the use of tools, like in the heart-wrenching game, This War of Mine. But to what end? The answer is in the name, to survive. In Animal Crossing, you hit trees to gather wood, you whack rocks for iron, gold, clay, and yes, of course, rock, you pick flowers, you can farm orchards, you can fish, you can catch insects, including dangerous wasps, but none of these causal mechanistic schemas are in aid of surviving. There is no hunger, thirst, or health in Animal Crossing, but if you're not careful, you can get stung. We will return back to this question nearing the end of this episode, but to arrive at a satisfying answer, which I very much hope I will do by the time I finish writing this, we need to take a look at every single aspect of what makes Animal Crossing, well, Animal Crossing. From the villages, to the island, to the houses, and of course, in another episode, we'll be talking about the community. Community is one of the most important aspects of Animal Crossing, from a commercial standpoint, especially in these days with social media. 
As I am making this video, Animal Crossing has just surpassed the all-time record of digital downloads in one month, over 5 million. However, the idea of promoting community wasn't driven by the progression of the internet or the ever-growing importance of social media, but instead was a design and marketing goal from the very beginning of development. Hisashi Nagami, a general producer at Nintendo, said in the same interview by Nintendo Europe, Originally, we wanted to create a game that would promote greater communication between family, where each player wouldn't share the same save data, but they would live in the same village. We created a situation like that, where you can exchange letters, you can write messages on the board, or you could speak with the animals and, you know, those animals will spread rumours. We added that kind of component for that purpose, and we noticed that it actually did help further promote communication amongst the family. The community portion of the series is going to be really interesting to dive deep into, from cool stories from the community, to the black market of turnip trading, to the weird conspiracy theories. But first, I would like to vainly talk about why I got into Animal Crossing. What made me buy the game in the first place? And what pushed me to sign up with Nook Inc. to go to a deserted island? I am a newcomer to the series. Up until about a week before launch, I had no understanding whatsoever as to what Animal Crossing is even about, what you do, and what the point of it all was, and why everyone apart from you was a strange humanoid animal, and why everyone has a massive head. Then one day, as I was sat in a call with one of my friends, as they were excited about the upcoming release of Animal Crossing New Horizons, they began talking about their experiences with the villagers in Animal Crossing who their favourite ones were, their experiences with communicating with these villagers, and so on. All of a sudden, well I say all of a sudden, after listening to the seeming ramblings of a madman for about an hour or so, it clicked. All of a sudden, I really wanted to become friends with a penguin, and talk about a hamster to them behind their back. I wanted to experience the social dynamics of this pretend world. I wanted to send gifts to them, make them laugh, witness them talking to each other, maybe even have an argument. The social aspect of this game was instantly exciting to me, and something that I have been hungry for in every role-playing game that I have ever played. And the closest that came to sustaining that hunger was The Witcher 3. Until now. For the uninitiated, let's break down exactly what villagers are, and what they can do. They can have their own home, of which they can sleep in, decorate, meander around in, invite friends around, and leave and enter whenever they please. They go to bed at different times, they have birthdays, they have different personalities, you can talk to them and hear rumours about other villagers, special events and special NPCs like KK Slider and Gulliver. Your real life friends can talk to them and they can remember them and talk to you about them. They can talk to each other, which can include arguing, but also gossip and general socialising. They can give each other gifts, they can get ill, they can even lose their stuff on the floor and you have to figure out which one of them it belongs to. You can give them a gift, they can give you a gift, they can sit down, run, walk, fish, catch bugs, and sing. They can get fleas during certain months, they can exercise, in fact most do, every morning. They can water plants, including your own. They can craft stuff and teach you the recipes they are using. They have their own catchphrases, they can drink and eat, they can react to things like wasp things and teach you reactions. They can build relationships together, such as Renee and Deli, or Eugene and Deli. Deli is a social dynamo on my island. They clap if they are near when you build something. They appear when you host a ceremony. They have to give you permission to move their home. They can ask you questions. They can play games with you. You can upset them. They can miss you. If you upset them too much, they can leave. Or you can just get Isabel to kick them out. They can wave to each other. They can have different attitudes to the weather, depending on their personalities. They will run up to you if they have something interesting to say. They can shop and buy clothes. They can participate in events like KK Slider singing or the fishing competition. And that's all I can think of at the moment. But that is still quite a lot. And all of these individual schemas on their own aren't really special or unique. But when they are all together and piled on by 10 villagers on your island at the same time, it can really make your island feel alive. And most importantly, immersive. I did a short video a few months back on immersion, using Hideo Kojima's Death Stranding as a case study. Death Stranding and Animal Crossing are very much different games, however they both do one thing really well. They squeeze every ounce of theme out of every nook and cranny of gameplay as possible, 
to create an incredibly immersive experience, and also an experience that doesn't disappoint. In the book The Art of Game Design, A Book of Lenses by Jesse Shelm, he mentions that there are two simple steps to using a theme to strengthen the power of your game's experience. Step 1. Figure out what your theme is. Step 2. Use every means possible to reinforce that theme. In the book, Shell often describes themes as questions, so let's do that for Animal Crossing here. If we take a look at the box art, there are three core components in view. You, or the character that you are roleplaying as, the villagers, and the deserted island. You could say the theme is, what would you do if you found yourself on a deserted island with weird freaky humanoid animals, though it's a bit of a mouthful and sounds kind of scary. Maybe not for the target audience. Another option is an oldie but goodie, what would you do on a deserted island? It's better for sure, less wordy and less scary, but we have already established that Animal Crossing isn't a survival game, and that definitely says to me at least, you are going to have to survive. And I think Nintendo were very aware of this. There are players that love survival games, there is a huge market for it. As you can tell by the list of popular survival games I mentioned earlier, but if Nintendo accidentally convinced those types of players to buy Animal Crossing, I'm sure they would have had to deal with a lot of refunds, and a lot of bad user reviews. If we take a look at their marketing material, Deserted Island Getaway Package is used consistently throughout all trailers and campaign materials. So Nintendo has to keep the Deserted Island part of the theme, that is core and fundamental. However, Getaway Package does the rest of the job for identifying the theme perfectly. Getaway, making the player feel that they are escaping to a new place free of all the negative parts of the real world, and the word package removes expectations of you not having everything you need when you arrive on your deserted island, completely eliminating any implications of a survival game. So that is our theme, a deserted island getaway package. Now let's see if Animal Crossing does all it can to back up that theme. Let me just reiterate why I bought Animal Crossing. I bought it because I was sold on the idea of interacting with villagers, but it's not that simple. If, let's just say if villagers were just cubes in a blank world, that if you interacted with them, they would spit out the same dialogue as villagers from the actual game. I would have been incredibly disappointed if that was the reality. Not just because it wouldn't look as nice, but because it wouldn't have matched the theme that I had in my head from all the marketing material, box art and community stories. When you start the game, you don't press new game or even interact with a menu. You start at an airport ready to fly to your deserted island. You are greeted by the two NPCs, Timmy and Tommy, that burst with personality. You go through the process of creating your character, which is recontextualized to your passport photo. As you get to your island, you fly over it and you see two villagers already there as they have chosen the same package as you. Upon arrival, you meet the infamous Tom Nook, who tells you all about the island. The opening sequence is perfectly crafted to be just like your dream stressless getaway experience. Straight away, you can talk to the other villagers about why they came to the island and share in their excitement about the new adventure. For more villagers to come to your island, you don't just select them from a menu and then drag and drop them in like some kind of god, nor do you just wait around and have no agency in the matter at all. No, instead you set up a campsite for villagers to come and visit, and you buy land of Tom Nook, as it is his island, to place down plots for homes. Then you go to the airport with a ticket that you have purchased and fly to a random island in search of villagers that you want to invite to the island. You have to convince them, but they are always willing to come. This process not only makes you appreciate the villagers you have more, especially the ones that you have had a direct hand in convincing them to come to your island, but you instantly have a personal story connected to them. Villagers are theme bolstering machines. Everything they talk about, everything they do, and more importantly, everything you see them doing all improves the solidarity of the context of the game and creates a better immersive experience. In that process of getting villagers to come to your island and eventually move to your island, you will have had to interact with a large aspect of the game that I know a lot of people in the community have grown to dislike, the UI. Designer of the Nintendo Power Glove, Rich Gold, great name by the way, in his book, Plentitude, describes an elementary example of theming. As a child, he had a book about elephants. 
The idea of the book was simple, to deliver an experience to children that lets them understand what elephants were. So you can take this goal and establish it as a theme. What are elephants? This covers step one of Jesse Shell's two-step guide to strengthening the power of your game's experience. However, there is still step two to go, which is to use every means possible to reinforce that theme. The author decided to cut their entire book, cover and pages, into the shape of an elephant. He had previously exhausted all of the obvious aspects that he could have bolstered the theme from. The art, the text, what the actual words said about elephants, and thought, what else is left? The actual shape of the book. This, though as stated, is elementary, is still a great example and lesson on how to look at your games. When you think you can't find another way to bolster your theme, look again. The UI is just that for Animal Crossing, and it may even be something you haven't paid too much attention to, other than maybe how slow or tedious it can be at times, which is a flaw of course, but first let's talk about what it does right. The clear and obvious example for the UI is your phone. It is a quick menu pop-up to access things like Nook Mileage Rewards, as well as Nook Miles Plus, which is just a reoccurring quest system like the Minutemen quests in Fallout 4, the map, as well as other sub-menus. However, rather than just shoving a menu into your face, covering the whole screen and taking you out of the immersive experience, your character pulls out their phone in animation, and the UI pops up to the side, taking up less than half the screen. Not only that, but the UI itself is shaped like a phone screen, which we can relate back to the use of the Shape of the Elephant book to bolster the theme. The phone UI is, like I said, quick and clear and an obvious way to use gameplay aspects to promote theme. But one of the less obvious ones for me anyway, was the inventory. You may not have noticed this, but when you look in your inventory, which have been renamed to pockets in this game, your character doesn't just disappear into the background like most games. Most games detach you from the game in these instances, as you as a player, not as the character that you are role playing as, roots through menus to find what you are looking for. But in Animal Crossing, your character puts their hand to their chin and begins a thinking animation as they look up at the thought bubble above them. When looking through your pockets, your character is remembering what is in their pockets from what they have put in it themselves beforehand. This works so much better for the overall theme and immersion than just having a menu that pops up. It doesn't only back up the internal logic of the game world, but having your inventory be pockets instead of a huge bag on your back like in Death Stranding really matches the deserted island getaway package theme. Even if you are carrying a lot of heavy items, chopping down trees, running all over the place, moving furniture or climbing ladders, you don't want your character to look like or even have the inkling of looking like they are exhausted or upset that they are performing the core gameplay loops. Of course the obvious immersion breaker is the fact that your pockets would have to be incredibly large to carry a fishing rod, pickaxe, ladders, vaulting pole, 20 fish and 5000 turnips. However, instead of the designers shying away from this discrepancy, they instead attempt to provide in-game world logic to the idea of putting your items in your pocket through the inventory upgrade system. To upgrade your inventory, your character learns how to better organise their items. So they aren't getting bigger pockets or a backpack like in Don't Star for example, but are just being more efficient. One of the most hated parts of the UI, however, isn't about the inventory UI specifically, but more about the tool UI, or lack thereof. In the inventory, it seems from the vocal minority, or majority, it's hard to say on Twitter, that they would like to see a progress bar showing how damaged your tools are. From what I understand, the introduction of breakable tools is new to the franchise and first introduced in Animal Crossing New Horizons. So just because of that, I can understand why people might not be enjoying that new mechanic. It is very similar to the response from fans of The Legend of Zelda series when The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild was released in 2017, in which that game also introduced breakable weapons. Which begs the question, why? If they knew that their fans would not like this new mechanic, why would they introduce it? Well, the simple answer is that if you take into account the logic of the game, your character doesn't know when your tool will break, so neither should you. 
I personally feel like it would have been better for the character to mention that a handle was splintering or that their net was fraying a few hits before it would break, but I understand their reasoning behind both the breakable tools and the lack of UI. However, there is a thin line that this game precariously walks with the rest of the UI in the game. The conversations are fine and necessary. Even the airport rigmarole, which people don't seem to enjoy, I understand because it's an airport. You have to go through a lot to get on the plane. And it also promotes the theme of the island getaway. But when it comes to buying and selling, that is where I don't quite understand the reasoning behind the limitations they put on the transactions. Limitations in video games are put in place to either promote creativity, gate progression, which this game does a lot, or to balance the game. You can argue that buying a restricted amount of fruits at a time balances the game, as you could break the economy quite easily by going to your friend's islands and selling non-native fruit for a higher price back and forth all day. So to make it a laborious task might actually be beneficial for the longevity of that player's time with the game. But if you're going to do that, don't obviously make it so inconsistent with just that part of the game. For example, buying turnips from the adorable boar known as Daisy May on a Sunday to get yourself on the stock market is done so painlessly and easy. You don't even have to work out the maths to see how many you can buy. You just press the as much as possible button and then your inventory is full as long as you have enough money. But on the other hand, when trading with Zipper the Bunny for eggs, it is the most mind-numbingly slow task I have ever witnessed apart from maybe having to push your car back for 20 minutes after you run out of gas in Final Fantasy XV. Another example is that you can sell as many items as you want at one time, and Timmy and Tommy at Nook's Cranny give you a total cost. But if we look at the other side of the transaction, you can only buy one of the items that is on display at once. What if I wanted a full inventory of a magic set? I shouldn't have to bother Timmy and Tommy to ring me up for every single purchase. For that example specifically, you can't even use the same argument as the airport matching the real life tedium because no shop in real life makes you buy one item at a time. There are other consistencies that are minor but are still worth mentioning. To speed up the text in game, you press B. To run, you press B. But to speed up crafting, you have to press A. I can understand why they did this for both the text and the crafting, but the inconsistencies lead to mistakes which the player can easily blame the game for rather than themselves, which I have stated many times in previous video essays, is the number one outcome for me as a designer to avoid. Let's go over a specific scenario. When crafting a bunch of items, which you have to do one at a time, you will be spamming A repeatedly, as not only does it help speed up the crafting time, but also when you go back to the crafting menu, it remembers the last thing you crafted and automatically selects it. However, the problem is that between you finishing crafting and going back to the crafting menu, your character speaks, and if you want to speed that up as well, you have to press the B button. The B button, incidentally, also closes the crafting menu. Many times I have pressed the B button at the wrong time, or too many times, and have closed the crafting menu. The same scenario with buying a lot of fruit from Nook's Cranny can occur. You need to spam A to buy as much fruit as quickly as possible, but you have to go through a lot of dialogue with Timmy and Tommy to get to the menus. So you have to press B to speed that up, which can close the menu and make you have to start the process all over again, which is worse than the crafting because of how much dialogue there is. I understand the reasoning behind the button commands, and I support the decision not to change them for specific actions, as that would cause even more confusion, but I thought I'd mention it because it caused a lot of frustration, which is the opposite of the theme of the game. You don't want to be frustrated when you're on your getaway. However, the game in most other aspects does a wonderful job of achieving that last part of the theme and its connotations, getaway package, especially the island itself. One of the more subtle ways that this game achieves the getaway feel the feeling that you have truly escaped the real world and all its hardships is that the island doesn't just feel like a separate landmass with the sea-like walls all around it keeping the real world out, but it feels like it's his own world. It does this in a really clever way. In my most recent game jam, I worked on an interplanetary exploration sim and I took big inspirations from Super Mario Galaxy and the way that their planets work. You as the player, both in my game and Super Mario Galaxy, walk around the planet 
which of course promotes the theme of space and planetary exploration, but also makes you feel more important than you would do on Earth as your size compared to the planet is bigger in comparison. But if we compare the games visually to that of Animal Crossing, you will begin to see the same effect of the world disappearing behind the horizon, as if you were on your own little planet. Just such a small additional touch that adds that little bit extra to that secluded getaway theme. Again, taking note from Rich Gold's book about elephants. The island meets the theme of the package. All inclusive, everything there on arrival, by having every resource required to start going through the gameplay loops, all easily accessible and all within the starting area of the game. Not that you need it, but you get your own shelter, you can pick fruits easily, and you can make your own tools. What is interesting about the island is that in one big way, it is almost eerily perfect. Too perfect, in fact. I am, of course, talking about the grid system that the whole island uses. If you hit a tree to get wood, bash a rock to get rocks, drop an item out of your inventory or shoot a gift from the sky, it will always land in the grid, or it will land and then adjust itself to a space on the grid. From what I can tell, it shares the same grid as that of the items that you can place down on the island, such as furniture. Which makes sense. It is an easy way for the designers and programmers to make sure that there can be no unwanted collisions with furniture just by checking whether a grid tile is occupied or not. It works well, until it doesn't. Firstly, it can cause issues with resources not being dropped from rocks and trees, despite your tools still taking damage when you hit them. If there isn't a tile for the resource to land on, then it just won't drop. This is especially bad for rocks because unlike trees, when you can just come back to it at any time and hit it again, once you hit a rock, it is on a timer that when it hits zero, it cannot be used again until the day resets at 5am. The maximum amount of resources you can get from a rock is 8, which makes sense. There are 9 tiles around the rock and one is occupied by you. However. If there is an item already in one of the tiles, it's usually a little rock that spawns next to the big rock that you can pick up, but can be a twig or weeds or whatever. Then no matter how many times you hit it, it will only drop seven resources. And less if there are more items surrounding the tiles around the rock, obviously. It doesn't sound like too big of a deal, but because of the rock's unique timer, if you take the time to then pick up either the resource that is blocking you or one of the resources you have already mined from that rock, you will most likely not be able to mine it again because the time would have gone down to zero, unless you were really, really fast. This all because the designers wanted to create the perfect world of no overlapping items or resources. The reason why I have a gripe about this specific decision is because it doesn't bolster the theme in any way, but can harm gameplay. So for me, it works out as a net negative as a design decision. They could have just as easily taken the approach of Minecraft rather than, say, Don't Starve, where everything is placed on the grid, but resources when mined are free to land where they want as long as they aren't inside an object. Finally, let's take a look at the house. I am going to save how progression in Animal Crossing New Horizons works for another video as I want to give it the time it deserves because with such a unique game and structure, it needed to handle progression and the motivation required to progress in the game really well. However, I will say that your house is tied to almost every single gameplay loop in the game. It is the crux of it all. You can mirror this to real life. You work to pay rent or your mortgage, to buy food to store in your house, to buy furniture, clothes, ornaments and your internet all for your house. It is the same with Animal Crossing, especially in the earlier entries to the franchise. In an Iwata asked interview before the release of Animal Crossing's New Leaf, the last main entry to the franchise before Animal Crossing New Horizons, co-director Aya Kuyogoku stated when asked about the direction of New Leaf, So far in the series, you have always moved to a town, got a loan to buy a house and worked at Tom Nook's shop. This statement was referring to the past games and their core gameplay loop. After, co-director Isao Moro added, in previous titles, the emphasis was on customising the interior of your home. Now despite New Leaf and subsequently New Horizons introducing a lot of schemas to make sharing your world not just about your home, but about your entire island or village, the core fundamentals and especially the core gameplay loop are still the same. You pay loans on your house to Tom Nook, to upgrade your home, to then pay loans, to then upgrade your home again. Every other mechanic in the game supplements that. 
From selling the hot items of the day to get more money, from playing the stock market, and even just picking up fruits. All go back to paying off those loans, to make your house bigger, so you can decorate it even more. I wanted to emphasize this more than the other topics that I've talked about, the villagers, the UI, the island, because if we are defining a genre for Animal Crossing, we need to start at the roots. Going back to and paraphrasing what Game Maker's Toolkit said in his video on the Souls-like genre, after all iterations, clones, bells and whistles have been stripped away to their barest of bare bones and only have fundamentals left in common, what are those fundamentals? For the Animal Crossing franchise, it's simple to answer, your home and decorating your home. So this is probably the biggest step towards answering our question of what genre is Animal Crossing. So like with our exercise earlier with survival games, let's get some examples that also share the same gameplay aspect of decorating your home. Of course the obvious one is The Sims, but there is also Minecraft, Harvest Moon, Fable 3, Second Life and Rune Factory, Tides of Destiny, just to name a few. However, if we want to have some serious comparisons, we should make sure that these games have a clear main goal that involves either gathering resources or income to decorate and expand your home. If we do that, all that's left is The Sims and Harvest Moon. Let's do a quick breakdown of these two games. In my experience of playing The Sims 4, my main goal was to learn trades like painting to make enough money to pay for furniture in my house. That was my main goal. There were other ways to achieve this goal, even going as far as to court other people to get married to just so they would also contribute to your household income and in turn make it so you can have more money to spend on decorating your house. I wanted to make a house that I couldn't afford in real life. This could have been mainly because I was sat at home playing The Sims all day, um, but that's here and there. This does match the theme that we had established for Animal Crossing New Horizons, the getaway theme. Get away from the stress of real life bills and saving money and instead spend it on a giant 50 inch TV from Timmy and Tommy to hang above your fireplace. I believe that The Sims, despite having other objectives, especially when you get about 20 DLCs in, is probably the closest comparison we will get to Animal Crossing. However, there is also Harvest Moon to look at. The objective of the game was to run a farm, get married and own a home together, of which you could decorate. However, in Harvest Moon, the game starts you off with the objective of running a farm and meeting the approval of your dad as you do so. The home buying and decorating aspect comes as an afterthought almost. The gameplay rewards players that keep to a strict schedule and do tedious work over and over again at the same time of the day. This work being the farming. Considering you have to work for everything, you can almost throw away the idea of meeting the getaway part of the established theme, and package is also a struggle to justify when it comes to Harvest Moon, but that's okay because they are different games. So, the question now becomes, if we're going to assign both Animal Crossing and The Sims a genre, what would it be? Well, the first part of the genre has been growing obvious throughout writing this essay. It's simulation. But games like Football Manager and Train Simulator also fall under that genre. And it goes without saying that they have wildly different goals and objectives and fundamental gameplay loops. In first person shooters, the fundamental game aspects that tie every game in that genre are the first person perspective and the shooting. The shooting is the means of which to achieve the goal in first person shooters. So let's say we have one part of the genre, simulation. What is the other part? Well, if we take first person shooters as a guideline, then it would be the means of which we achieve the goal in both The Sims and Animal Crossing. So if discovering what the second part to the genre is, is identifying how you obtain the core goal in the game, which is upgrading and decorating your home, then we have to look at how you do that. Well, it costs money to do that. So if money is the means to obtain the goal, let's list every way to earn money in Animal Crossing New Horizons. First off, you can't buy natural resources other than your island's fruit from Nook's Cranny, and you can't craft things just out of that fruit, which means that you cannot earn money by trading anything in the game other than turnips. And I'm not talking about the turnip exchange, as trading on a scale like that wasn't intended as a social or causal mechanistic schema. However, you can earn money by crafting items from natural resources, from money trees, from rocks if you are lucky, popping balloons and interest from your bank account. All of these involve positive action from the player's part, which means that they have to actively perform those actions to achieve money. 
those actions are varied enough to not be able to give us a genre on their own, not like sports simulation games like FIFA or Madden that is. The best way that I could describe those causal mechanistic schemas is with the umbrella term of work. Wait, work? No, work is boring. I said before how you don't want your character to look like they're working. It completely goes against the getaway, the package, all of the themes, all the words in the themes. Or does it? As we are talking about work, I think it would be a good idea to turn back to The Art of Game Design, A Book of Lenses by Jesse Shell one more time, specifically on the chapter on motivation. I did say that I wanted to cover motivation in a different video, and because motivation is so detailed and in depth, there's so many studies on it, I will do so, but I'm going to talk about it more right now. Motivation is something that the developers of Animal Crossing handled very well, and when we take a look at the simple matrix in this chapter, you can understand why. This matrix is to help designers understand what aspects of the game might be harmful or beneficial to the motivation of the players playing their game, and the matrix is also used to suggest the reasons behind the actions that the player takes in the game and the core motivation of the player when doing said actions. These reasons are split into two categories pain avoiding and pleasure seeking. In the pain avoiding category, there is avoiding punishment and avoiding shame. In the pleasure seeking category, there are rewards and fun. Now having avoidance as a motivator in a game is just hideous design. You know what is the best way to avoid pain in your game? Not to play. Animal Crossing makes sure all tasks in their game, which are aimed at achieving the core goal, which is expanding and decorating your home, are in the pleasure seeking category. Players that have fun and enjoy decorating their home are going to be more motivated to play the game every day to chop wood and mine rocks and subsequently craft the hot items of the day to sell at Nook's Cranny to get more money to decorate and expand their homes. And on top of that, depending on how many items you have decorated your home with, you get extra rewards from the Happy Home Academy, which are of course extra items to decorate your home with. So by doing tasks that you enjoy, you get rewards that you also enjoy. This idea is bolstered even more with the most recent evidence of Nintendo actively having to hinder the effectiveness of interest on your savings because it was unbalanced. And in return for making one of the ways to get money to decorate and expand your home worse, they gifted everyone a carpet to decorate their home with. Animal Crossing is work without the pain avoidance motivator. There is no boss above your head ready to give you a scolding if you don't chop down enough trees for that day. There aren't any deadlines to hit to do with your home, as the loans on your home can be paid back at any time and are interest free. All the negative connotations to do with work are absent and all the positive rewarding aspects of work are ever present in the core gameplay loop and core motivator of Animal Crossing. This is why it separates itself so well from games like Harvest Moon and Stardew Valley and even all the Facebook games like Farmville that it gets compared to for some reason. There is no paid avoidance motivator to get the player to play when it comes to the core gameplay loop, yet the player still works to achieve their goal to achieve the pleasure that they seek when decorating and upgrading their house. Therefore, I am going to end this video by saying that in my opinion, and after looking at all the evidence, I can say that Animal Crossing New Horizons is a work simulator. Hey guys, I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I do hope that you enjoy listening to me talk about Animal Crossing for so long. When I started this project, I didn't expect it to take so long, nor did I expect the video to be so long, and I definitely didn't expect to have to make three of them. But as a game designer, I found Animal Crossing instantly exciting. It was fresh and unique compared to any game that I had played before, and I really wanted to test myself with the task of understanding why Animal Crossing works. Please check out the links in the description to my website, my studio's social media pages, as well as my how long to be, which I will start leaving a link to so people can keep up to date with what I'm playing and what I've completed if they are interested. Thanks for watching once more, goodbye and stay safe.